from certain specific e economic backgrounds, etc. So they have this access to, so you see, for instance, uh, a, a, a very famous kind of schooling system that has emerged over the last decade uh, in India is, you see, the Cambridge uh, pattern of education system in schools or the Oxford pattern of education system in schools. And when they talk about inclusive education, where they talk about equal education, where they talk about modern day education and preparing global citizens, but also you see what or who are those students who can really afford to study in those schools so on the in the post colonies they talk about equality in the post colonies they talk about inclusivity in the post colonies we talk about holisticity when it comes case of knowledge distribution when it comes case of knowledge dissemination but in reality you find it is something which is very interestingly put forth a very a very interesting idea that was given by uh, you know, Akil Bilgrami, Professor Akil Bilgrami from the University of Columbia, he talks about a perspective of lexicographical ordering. Now, he obviously talks about in a different context. He talks about in the context of secular, uh, secularism when religion comes in uh, contrary to politics. But here, I recontextualize I, his idea and present it as where you see a lexicographical ordering. That, that is, you talk about e equality, but with a slight difference. You talk about inclusivity, but with a slight hierarchy. You talk about holisticity with a brief exclusivity. So you see, you know, these problems always exist across the country in our contemporary times. So access to academic institutions, you will see that where are like some of the schools that we talk about that where we have these rankings of schools and the universities, right? All, uh, you know, every year, different organizations, they come up with different patterns of ranking. So what do we usually see is that whenever we look at the rankings, whenever we look at these particularistic dimensions, where are those universities or where are those schools mostly located who gets a higher rank? Doubtlessly, they will be mostly located in the center of the urban areas. How many so-called rural educational institutions, how many so-called educational institutions which exist outside the mainstream physical and the metaphysical spaces of the city get a good rank in terms of their quality of education? Hardly you will find. I'm not saying that never it happens. It happens, but hardly you will find. If you do a percentage, uh, you know, if you do a statistical comparison, easily you will find it. So why this? So this is, you see, well, this is something which we have, you know, imbibed from the European colonizers that how you systematically you create differences, systematically you create hierarchies, and then you present it in front of everybody. That you see, this is normal. This is how, this is what it should be like. So this is something which we have gained from the European colonizers. Similar thing, if you come to job opportunities as well, it's a very common phenomenon where you see. You know, at least uh, if I just give you one small example from my particular state to which I belong, that is West Bengal, where you see that, you know, skin color is a strong underlying defining phenomenon to give you a good job. I mean, often it happens, it happened in front of me several times where people who are very capable, who are intellectually very rich, just because their skin color the fetishism towards the fair skin colors, you know, still there in job opportunities. In fact, in the newspapers, in many English newspapers, you will see uh, we require uh, an assistant uh, for our uh, particular, uh, you know, clothes shop. And we require a, a, a girl of, you know, 21 years old who is very presentable and is fair skin in color. So by default, if one has to be presentable, one has to be fair skinned in color. So, so this fetishism towards fair skin, this hatred towards black skin, and we see, I mean, there is an existent narrative that racism doesn't exist in India, which is very problematic. We see racism is very much there in India, in contemporary India. We have seen, you know, through Islamophobia, we have seen, you know, towards, uh, you know, anti-Christian sentiments. And we are also seeing through our differences that are being put forth in terms of skin color as well. So it, this is one other major, uh, you know, problem that you see in availability of job opportunities. And also not only skin color, you find a racism, a form of geographical racism as well. So if 
somebody is reading from an English medium school, as we see in West Bengal, I'm not generalizing across India. Uh, in West Bengal, let me see if you're from an English medium school, you have a better chance of getting a job compared to someone who is from a non English medium school. So someone is coming from a Bengali medium school or a Hindi medium school has a lesser chance because by default they are taken for granted because they have started, they have studied or have earned a degree from a local language medium school. Therefore, uh, you know, they are not actually uh, not in a position, you know, to do job or to just do justice to a particular job. So such kind of, or if you're belonging to an, a rural area, you are not taken into so much account or if you're if you belong to a rural area and somebody in your competitor is there from an urban area by default on many occasions the person who is from urban area gets a better preference in a job from a rural area so you see these kind of dichotomies these kind of differences this kind of binaries that exist that we experience in our daily life is something which we should ponder about in the post colonies before we celebrate the post colonial before we celebrate the post colonies it is extremely important for us to ponder about these aspects next you find very interestingly architectural differences you know there is a weird dimension associated with this architecture so people certain people with certain economic positionalities or caste positionalities or class positionalities are expected to have a certain form of architectural affinity or in other words to simplify further you'll see that if a person is a very rich businessman that person is expected to have a certain structure or a certain kind of house if a person is driving an auto rickshaw the person is supposed to have a certain kind of house and if those parameters are, or, or if those differential frameworks are violated maybe it might happen that a businessman is not doing good he's having a small house or his he is not having a very beautifully architectured house it might happen an auto rickshaw driver who earns honestly on a daily basis is flourishing well or a roadside you know, uh, 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 a roadside food seller or a shopkeeper, a uh, roadside vegetable seller might be earning a lot. Uh, he or she might have constructed a fantastic, beautifully architectured house. You know, people usually will see people look at them with a lot of skepticism. We often see in our regular conversation, people say that this, uh, you know, vegetable seller has a three story house. He or she must be you know, indulge in the wrong way of earnings. But usually for a businessman, people will hardly question that. Oh, for a businessman, it's normal. The businessman must be flourishing, whether he's flourishing through black money or white money, no one really cares. But the businessman has to have a very beautifully structured three story big house with a big balcony, garden, swimming pool, etc. But if that happens with the auto rickshaw seller, if that happens with a, you know, roadside vendor, then that has to be even if the person is earning honestly and doing everything through hard work then that person will looked at skeptically and this is something which we have drawn from the western eurocentric ideologies of capitalism where capitalism where capitalism makes layers create layers and they say that if you surpass those layers of your existence then you will not be allowed to sit within the mainstream social structure Similar ways you can look at the locational hierarchies as well. The locational hierarchies are that, for instance, you will see it's, it's very common in India that again, based on your class, caste, social ranks, you are expected to stay in a certain specific place and not to violate and go beyond that. So for instance, uh, today, we see that uh, the so-called concept of modern housing in India is that you construct huge campuses and, uh, you know, they have 4 BHK, 5 BHK and 6 BHK and many facilities and uh, so many things. But you will see one thing, even if you are capable financially, if you are capable of staying there, you are having a good job, you are, you are doing in a very respectable position, you are a great human being, still, you may not be allowed <clears throat> to stay in a particular place because that particular place is meant for people of certain caste, certain class, certain religion, 
certain social structures. Interestingly, let me give you a very practical example. Uh, when my sister used to stay in Dwarka in New Delhi, there was an apartment just side there. There was like a apartment complex just aside where uh, my sister used to stay. Now that apartment was referred to as the Bahawalpur apartment. The name of the apartment, the complex, and interestingly, each and every resident, each and every resident, I repeat again, were Muslims. No other religious communities would stay there. Another interesting part is if you look at the architectural designs of the apartments, of the buildings, if you look at the windows, if you look at their, you know, uh, at the balconies from outside, obviously, if, if you look at that, you will see they have a great affinity with the Mughal architecture. So you see, this is how, you know, it is something the architectural differences, if you look around, this architectural differences so much come to the forefront. So the very architecture, the very appearance actually is expected to show that what kind of people stay there. So these kind of differences, these kind of dichotomies that exist today and in other parts of India also is must be existing. I'm pretty much sure where you on the basis of your architecture, you're expected to stay there. Now, similarly, it's on the basis of your location, you are expected to stay there. So you see, this is how architectural differences, locational differences that we have imbibed this culture from the colonizers also come to the forefront. And then you have access to health facilities, which I'm pretty much sure we experience on a daily basis, where you are treated on the basis of your, uh, of your capability of pain, where you are treated on the basis of your job belongingness, where you are treated on the basis of your, uh, you know, on the, on the basis of your financial status. So obviously you are not treated, especially you see this problem in the private hospitals. You know, you have big branded hospitals, obviously I'm not going to take anybody's name, but you have big branded hospitals where you see that you, you visit those hospitals and uh, you, you get a bed or you get a cabin or you get a good treatment, you get a good behavior, you get a, you know, uh, you know, a good service. Everything is based not on the, on the grossness of your health problem or not on the basis of your level of health problem. Whether you die, whether you live because of your health problem, no one really cares. It is based on the amount of money that you are capable of paying. And this is what, again, uh, a, a blind side, a dark side of the Eurocentric, uh, you know, problems of capitalism that we face today in the post colonies. And then you have other examples as well. You have to access to daily groceries. You see the location of the grocery shops. You stay a bit in the outskirts. <coughs> uh, excuse me. You stay uh, a bit in the outskirts and you have a problem with groceries. You don't get online services. Or if you call the you know online uh, service sellers, they will say, "Sorry, our location is not here, or we are not supposed to deliver the goods here, or we will only come to a certain distance, and from there you have to collect and go back to your home." So you see the differences that are always created, the systematically how they are being generated. Obviously, the reasons that are presented is that you have poor roads, uh, you have poor internet connectivity, you have poor weather conditions, you have poor accessibility, etc. But why they are poor in certain places and why they are not poor in certain places? These questions, these are very fundamental questions, very common questions. We ask, but we don't ask it prominently. Or we fail to ask them or we don't care to ask them. And then you have other examples as well with respect to besides daily groceries. You look at transportation facilities as well. Okay. In places in, in India, how many places you have where the metro services goes to the rural areas? First of all, again, across India, there are hardly few states where, uh, you know, metro rail services are available. Obviously, in the near future, there are plans to come up, but that's a different story. Um, and now, even if you have metro railway facilities, you will see they are connected. They say that we are connecting the metro railways with the main junction points. Now the question is, how do you identify certain areas, certain junctions as the main areas? And how do you 
non identify certain areas as not such main areas or not junction areas it is based on where you will have a shopping mall in general you will see you will have a shopping mall you will have office complexes you will have uh, you know uh, entertainment parks you will have entertainment houses and only usually only those places centrally i am not generalizing again but centrally are those places which are identified as junctions or important places to connect metro services now because in other places in a village you don't have office goers they are mostly agricultural workers so it is by default it is taken into account that they, they don't need to travel they don't need to go uh, avail the metro they don't have the right to come to the city or people don't have the right to visit them in the villages etc so you see this is how you know interestingly in our daily life now why did i bring these examples i brought these examples categorically to relate the argument that why we should question the very existence and the functionality of the post of the post colonies in india in the contemporary era is because of these regular hindrances that we face and these hindrances are not just something which is very syntagmatic it's paradigmatic in nature it's always happening historically it is not something which is right now located uh, you know uh, or it is happening just in 5 to 10 years ago from 5 to 10 years ago it is not happening it is happening historically it has a history behind it it has a historical issue behind it and that needs to be categorically addressed and where lies the history we can see it belongs to european colonialism we can see into the euro north american centric uh, you know capitalism that we face today and then what happens you know the impacts of such hierarchies and today the impacts of such hierarchies is uh, the 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 point is that this rural urban public private authentic inauthentic we say it's an authentic place it's an inauthentic place or we talk about this is a public place this is a private place or this is a very good perspective this is a very bad perspective or we say this is something genuine and this is something fraud or we say this is something positive this is something negative or this is something high this is something low so these kind of cultural social economic political religious communal racial a uh, geographical topographical and several other forms of binaries that we give birth on a daily basis on the basis of these parameters is something that emerges from this misunderstanding misinterpretation and the misrepresentation of the post colonies that where we exist today now so the question is now what to do what is the what could be our possibilities of counter resistance now the possibilities of counter resistance that we see basically is is to interrogate and dismantle you know this colonially structured philosophies that govern the function of the post colonies and to provincialize them now what do i mean by provincializing them now i mean by provincializing them is that we are obviously we exist when we when the world has been divided as countries nation states federations districts villages localities we are already physically provincialized physical provincialization on pen and paper has taken long time back but the problem is beyond the physical provincialization that is ideological provincialization is very necessary and i will base my arguments on uh, you know on two works one is of dipesh chakraborty's provincializing europe and another is ashley mbembe's on the post colony obviously there are wide works and obviously we have a paucity of time so i'm not going to go into a lot of details just to touch upon them if you read dipesh chakraborty's provincializing europe where chakraborty uh, to cut a long story short chakraborty talks about that uh, the europe that we live in or the europe that governs the world is an imaginary europe you know physically europe is a very small continent it's like any other continent so but still why europe dominates the world still today it says it is not the physical europe that dominates the world it's the imaginary europe that dominates the world the imaginary europe that were that were curated uh, you know developed transformed and which has been by by the european colonizers for the last 500 years and in the contemporary era it has been translated 
into those individualistic post-colonial spaces in the contemporary era. And what has been translated, and Dipesh Chakraborty used this word translation very categorically here, and he uses the word translation to tell that how it has been translated, the cultures have been translated into our own cultures, their language has been translated, their attitudes have been translated, their, their, their dressing patterns have been translated, their behavioral patterns have been translated, and because of this translation, what happened is we fail to realize that we somewhere, somewhat, we are acknowledging the Western ideologies still today, blindly we are acknowledging. Why we fail to look at that? Why we fail to understand that? Because it's not just we have imbibed them. Now, they are not, they are no more visible to us. They're completely invisible. And this invisibility has been created by the translation of the European ideologies into our contemporary era. On a similar note, obviously from a different context, Ashile Mbembe, uh, a, a very famous Cameroonian philosopher, in his book on the post-colony, among several things, he talks about two very interesting aspects. And those two interesting aspects are, one he talks about is the banality of power. And the second portion or the second perspective that he categorically talks about is that uh, the aesthetics of vulgarity. Now, this aesthetics of vulgarity, if you talk about, if you basically see, now when he talks about this banality of power and the aesthetics of vulgarity, uh, he categorically says one thing that you see, uh, and he talks in the African political context, obviously, but we can look at it in the wider context as well. We can look at it in the Indian context as well. And he says that usually the Europeans, among several negative things, the European colonizers have talked about that vulgarity whether it comes in terms of verbally, physically, in terms of writing, in terms of silence, in terms of body languages, the vulgarity is actually artistic in nature. And this is why today we feel proud when we, you know, uh, make fun about, about a person with a black skin. Or we feel happy or we feel like giggling when we body shame someone. We feel like giggling when we call a person fat or a per person is of short height or a person is, a, you know, dark skinned in color. We, we take pride, pride in that. We see, we feel like we have done something very intelligent, something very aesthetic, something very valuable. And I've made the people laugh. Or when we crack jokes and make others laugh based on someone's inferior skin color, based on someone's inferior physical structure, based on someone's inferior height, etc., or gender. That is why we have so many jokes that center around the transgenders or the hijras. In movies, you must have seen. In, in daily uh, life co communication, you must have seen where people just crack jokes and make others laugh. Why it has happened? The aesthetics of vulgarity, the aesthetics of arrogance that the European colonizers have taught. And it, it has become so normalized in our habitual existence that we fail to realize that. And this is in connection with this. This is what also Mbembe talks about the banality of power. That is where you, where, where we keep on creating hierarchies, where we keep on generating differences, where we keep on creating violences without understanding the wider impact that how it actually narrows down our everyday. Even if I am the generator of violence, I am violating my own self as well in a way, whether it's a physical violence, whether it's a metaphysical violence or whatever it is. So that is what, you know, banality of power and the vulgarity of aesthetics the Mbembe talks about, and which also, you know, are some of the important points when I was discussing that how on an everyday basis we are getting violated within the post colonies, how on an everyday basis binaries are being generated within the post colonies, we see this vulgarity, this aesthetics of vulgarity, aesthetics of arrogance, banality of power, and the failure to realize the importance of ideological provincialization. Now, provincialization in the context of India, when we talk about provincialization in the context of India, what we basically see is, you know, the post colonies, now, how do we engage in this act of provincialization? And obviously, we have to do as a collective entity. We all have to understand the importance of it. We all have to, irrespective of our 
geographical, cultural, all sorts of differences, we have to understand the importance and the impact of it. So the first point is, we have to understand one thing that the, when we interpret the post colonies, suppose, let me give you a very, very common example. If you come to Bengal, the usual minds of the people is Bengalis only eat fish and rice. If you come to Maharashtra, the usual mindset is the people there only have vada pav. So vada pav is equal to Maharashtra. Fish and rice is equal to Bengal. Idli, sambar and dosa is equal to Chennai. Okay, puttu biryani is equal to Kerala. Now, this is what is happening with this kind of elements, this kind of exoticization, which is again something we have learned from the colonizers. This kind of exoticization of cultures and traditions has actually given birth to several problematic archetypes, socio-cultural archetypes, which needs to be dismantled and disowned completely. We have to understand that the post colonies, whether it's a Chennai, it's, it's Tamil Nadu or Maharashtra or West Bengal or Gujarat or whatever it is, the all the post colonies that we stay here, they cannot be interpreted, their culture, their society, their food practices, their fashion sense cannot be interpreted within a fixed set of parameters. It is always transformative and transitional in nature. Obviously, there are certain specific rooted cultures and traditions, but there is not one root culture and tradition. So it doesn't mean that uh, traditional food in India or tra uh, tra so, sorry, traditional food in Bengal only means fish and rice. There are a lot of other traditional food, uh, you know, culinary practices in West Bengal, which are very rooted to the to our indigenous traditions. But we fail to acknowledge that by submitting by foolishly submitting ourselves to those traps of archetypes on a daily basis and it is and this is why we have to understand that any form of culture is always transformative always transitional and is asymplastic in nature obviously the roots cultures and traditions that were once existent that started 50 years back 100 years back 500 years back or whatever they are evolving gradually day by day obviously they need to be acknowledged but we should not fall into the trap of stereotyping number two when we are fighting on an everyday basis, we have to understand that fighting the colonial ideologies in our daily life is an everyday project. It's not an academic project. It's not just a conference. It's not just a lecture. It's not just a workshop or it's not just, you know, you know, uh, you know, writing a research paper. It's much beyond that. It's an everyday project. And we have to do it at our every instance of our life consciously. On a daily basis, we are eating, we are laughing, smiling, talking, singing, dancing, sleeping, bathing, whatever we are doing. On an everyday basis, through our everyday practices, practice, we have to, you know, resist the existence of the colonial ideologies. It's a non-conclusive process. It's a never-ending process. It's it, This project has a beginning, but it has no end. We have to understand that. The third way of provincialization is it is very important for us to see that we acknowledge each other's existential differences. Now, every tradition, every now there is no indigenous culture of India. I can never say there is one indigenous culture of India. There are so many states, territories, localities, villages, urban areas, and other forms of modern day nation state distributions within each of the spaces within each of this post colonial spaces we have our own versions of indigenous cultures and traditions we have our own versions of indigenous lifestyles we have our own versions of indigenous way of thinking speaking doing and living and those differences need to be acknowledged this is third way of provincializing ideological provincialization where we don't say that indigenous cultures and traditions of india no we need to particularize it we need to specify we need to acknowledge and identify each and every differential cultures and traditions that exist and that is something what we refer to as depolarized pluralities this is a a, a phrase which has been um, coined by portuguese a uh, historian, legal scholar, uh, a very famous Portuguese historian and decolonial legal scholar. His name is Boaventura de Souza Santos. Boaventura de Souza Santos. 
uh, and he coined this concept of depolarized pluralities, um, where he says that you see that plurality alone cannot help us. What we need is a depolarized plurality where we don't submit ourselves or where we don't become a victim of different two different poles on the two different sides. Rather, we acknowledge each other's differences and we exist on the same platform. Now, what does it mean acknowledging each other's differences? Acknowledging each other's differences, it simply means that it doesn't mean that we say we accept each other. It is not necessary. We let us be free not to accept each other. Let us be very critical of each other. Let us criticize each other's uh, ideologies and dimensions freely. But that has to happen on a healthy note. Now, what do I mean by on a healthy note? It means that it is not necessary that you have to agree with me. I have to agree with you. But what is necessary is we respect each other's viewpoints and then we counter. And that gives us a chance to engage in a holistic and critical way of representation that it enables us to engage in a holistic dimension and a critical way of representation. Otherwise, what happens mostly we see it's about personal bashing. It's about humiliating one's own religious belongingness. It's about hu humiliating one's own sexual orientation. And in the process, we are failing to critical, critically engage in, 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 in on a daily basis with respect to new dimensions and thoughts. So for this critical engagement can only enable us to bring out new ideas, new ways of living, to build together various economies of care and share. But if you're not doing that, then what is happening is it only ends up in personal bashing and, you know, vulgarities and, you know, abusing each other. And that is what mostly happens we see in the social media. Next is another form of pro uh, provincialization is to acknowledge the various knowledges, the oral narratives that we have gained from our forefathers and foremothers, which is very important. We all emerge from diverse constellations of indigenous systems of knowledges. We as individuals, we as communities, we have respective geographical positions, etc. We all emerge from diverse constellations of indigenous systems of knowledges. And what we see is we have all our respective differences. Some of those indigenous systems, they actually, you know, uh, converge with each other. Some you see are conflictual in nature, but we need to acknowledge that. Because if we don't acknowledge our very roots of emergence, how can we exist? How can we have an identity of our own? And then obviously, the other points is this will enable us to do away with the forms of binaries. The binaries, if you remember, I was talking about in this particular slide, which is very important. And this provincialization process, if it can be applied gradually, it will enable us to overcome this binaries and also prevent us from mainstreaming the diverse modes of our everyday existence. We should remember that we don't need to be in the mainstream social structure. We can be at the very borders. You know, there is a famous um, Latin American theorist. Her name is Gloria Anzaldua. Uh, she gave this um, idea about border thinking. And this obviously she gave in a gender context. She was talking about Chicana fe feminism, Chicano theories and all. She gave in a gender context and she gave this idea of border thinking. Border thinking is being very conscious of not affiliating to the center. If I have to do something, if I have to be unique and different from others, and if I give you a very general example, a very simple example, if I have to be very unique and different from others, what is necessary for me to realize is that I should not mainstream my thoughts and ideas. I should to acknowledge the diverse modes of everyday existence. We don't need to mainstream ourselves within those narrow spaces of the mainstream social structure. We can be at the very geographical borders, cultural borders. We can be at the social borders, economic borders, racial borders, political borders, topographical borders. No problem. From there, we can generate our thoughts, which in fact, you, I mean, you can look at the subaltern scholars as well. That is what the subaltern scholar says, especially if you look at the later subaltern scholars like Ganendra Pandey, uh, Gyan Prakash and all, they see that we should not affiliate or try to occupy the center. 
Because if we have to present our own thoughts and ideas, and if we try to occupy the center of any social structure, in the process, what is happening is we fall into the trap of being mainstreamed. And that is why today you have, or today we have ideas like Dalit Brahmins. Why do we have this term called the Dalit Brahmins? Because it is the it is those Dalits who are getting mainstreamed, and maybe by caste they belong to Dalits, but ideologically they are being Brahmanized. They are being sterilized as Brahmins. And this is why mainstreaming is very problematic. Now to conclude, which I'll, uh, I'll finish up because I can see that uh, the time is all, also almost up. Um, and then we can have discussion. So basically, if we can undergo this process of provincialization, uh, some important dimensions or some important perspectives uh, that can be brought to the forefront is what are some of the things that we are provincializing on a daily basis? And those things are particularly what we are provincializing is, number one, we need to provincialize the architectural patterns. Architectural structures, those class, caste, religion, culture, race-based differences that are assigned to certain architectural patterns that if you belong to this caste, only you can stay only in this kind of houses, etc. Those need to be provincialized and dehierarchized, and those binaries need to be dismantled. Educational institutions need to be provincialized where you establish educational systems in such a manner, you establish the educational patterns in such a manner that it is accessible financially, culturally, socially, geographically accessible to all. You create the you create a you know an education system which acknowledges the differences at, at the same time in terms of pedagogical patterns, in terms of teaching, in terms of syllable structures, in terms of the salary structures, in terms of the physical infrastructural structures. You create such educational institutions across the country, each and every educational institutions, higher educational, school education, whatever it is, so that it is accessible for all to be a part of it and learn equally with each other, not in, differential with, not in difference with each other, but in collaboration with each other, where, one, where individuals get that space. Provincializing geographies, where you stop drawing lines based on you know, uh, urban, rural, uh, you know, based on the accessibility to daily needs of life, you stop drawing line on the basis of, you know, uh, of online access, of internet services, of, of basic access to daily needs and all. So provincializing geographies and topographies are very important. Where you value each and every geographical spaces, where we value each and every topographical space, and we stop creating any kind of physical and ideological differences. And the last two is the provincializing residential patterns and provincializing access to health services, which is extremely necessary. That is provincializing residential patterns where we don't create the difference that only that by on the, again, going back to the same question of caste, class, and religion, where we don't say that, okay, this particular area is only assigned for the Christians. This particular area is only for the Muslims. This particular area is only for the Hindus. This is for the Brahmins, this is for the Kshatriyas, this is for the Vaishyas, etc. Et we stop creating these kind of differences. You know, these kind of silly differences that we still live with. So this provincialization of these, this is also necessary where we value the fluid uh, exchange of cultures, of traditions, of lifestyles, of food habits, and etc. And most importantly, another important point is with which I would end is the provincializing access to health services, which is again very ne necessary. Still today, there are hardly any, uh, you know, medical institutions or hospitals where you see a separate uh, ward or a separate, uh, you know, ward is meant for the transgenders. They become an object of joke in most of the health institutions still date where from the main ward they're asked to go to the female ward, from female ward they're asked to go to the male ward. They don't have hardly there, you know, gradually there are many health institutions which are gradually becoming conscious about it right now and they're coming up with transgender wards. But still it is very low. It is hardly there. And so you see, you know, provincializing access to health services where we value, and I gave him one example of transgender. I mean, you can do it from, try to understand from other dimensions and other perspectives as well. No problem with that. But when you talk about this provincializing access to health services, you see, what is necessary is where we, again, once again, look for the equal accessibility. We 
should look for that all the individuals, irrespective of the gender belongingness, economic belongingness, racial belongingness, whatever it is, they have the access to health services, basic health services all across. And for that, these kind of transformations are required. So it is so this provincialization, this process of provincialization is not a one day process. It's it, if we need to dismantle the master's house, we need to do away with the master's tools. We cannot use the master's tools and say now we are trying to kill our master. It's never possible. We, we will remain stuck where we were 500 years back. We, we will remain stuck in the same scenario, rather in a much more transformative, more evolved and a more problematic situation that we live in today. And we can all already see that with this, you know, already so much of politics, racial politics, cultural politics, you know, class politics, caste politics have already started with respect to the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines in India. We can already see certain health centers are not getting proper supplies, especially those which are located in the very rural parts where media houses are not going to go and focus on the stories and all. So you see these kind of dirty politics on an everyday basis we are indulging ourselves is something we need to deeply think about. And we need to look at the roots of all these problems, which lie somewhere else, not in the contemporary era. So with this, I would like to end my reflections. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for your uh, very, uh, you know, very kind and, you know, uh, you know, very patient listening to me. Thank you once again.